Um, actually, I'm not going to talk so much about, um, I'm not going to give you like a short version of the book as such. In the book, I sort of talk about sort of 10 different kinds of truth that we have. Yeah, is, the, is the sound okay? Are you hearing me okay? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, rather, I wanted to focus on the subtitle of the book, Consolations for a Post-Truth World. Because I think that, you know, when we think about this post-truth phenomenon, it's very easy to get somewhat depressed and dispirited by it. You know, every time a certain uh, billionaire turned president tweets some kind of nonsense, um, a lot of us just kind of like put our heads in our hands and kind of wonder how, how we got here. But actually, you know, I, I think we've got reason to be more positive than that. I mean, one important fact to remember, to remember is that why are people talking about a post-truth world? You know, why are we even talking about this? We're talking about it because people are concerned about it, because most people haven't given up on truth. They're worried about the way in which truth seems to be not being given enough respect and is being trampled on and abused. And hence, that's why there's all this worried talk about the post-truth world. So I want to kind of focus a little bit on perhaps reasons to be more positive about it and why we shouldn't despair. I mean, overall, the view I kind of have is that my hope is that, you know, it's re really not entering a new age of a post-truth world, that when we look back, we'll, just, we'll think of this rather as, if you like, a post-truth moment, a kind of a, a spasm that culture went through, the society went through, as it sort of progressed to a slightly more mature view. Now, the first one, which I think we can sort of begin to see this in a more positive light, is to see how actually, you know, post-truth is not an invention of, of Donald Trump or uh, the campaign in Britain to leave the European Union or pick your favourite example of a political group who have been economical with the truth. Um, it's, it's not something that came out of nowhere. There's a deep sort of cultural history to this. And the good news is that that cultural history is actually one of progress. What I really want to suggest is that progress caused the crisis in a very real way. So there are many different sources of this. Take first of all, perhaps the longest one, science. In science, we got confusion. What do I mean by that? Well, science has of course been, I think, a tremendous benefit to humanity in discovering the truth. We understand truths about the way the world works much more today because of uh, science than we'd ever did before. But of course, what science did was it didn't just give us this truth. It also revealed that the world is not how it appears to common sense. It doesn't behave in the ways that we you know, think it does. That behind appearances are all sorts of extremely surprising sort of mechanisms. And the laws of physics all right, the laws of physics, laws of quantum physics, is absolutely, completely contrary to all common sense. And so, actually, what's happened is science has, on the one hand, enabled us to progress and to get a more truthful and complete picture of the world. But in doing so, it's undermined the confidence of ordinary people to be able to trust their own sense of how the world works, or if you like, you know, folk wisdom about the way the world works. So it's doing this strange thing at the same time, both building truth and undermining our own confidence that we can know the truth and see the truth for ourselves. And this is emphasised and exaggerated by the fact that science itself is a dynamic process. I mean, science is always moving on. It's the nature of any scientific theory that it is always possible, and it often happens, that someone else will come along a little bit later and show that that theory was incorrect or incomplete and come up with a better theory in the future. And so even science itself, so on the one hand, it's kind of giving us more truth, but it, the truths of science don't have that status of incontrovertible permanent fact. It's, it's permanently in motion. So we have uh, a truth machine, if you like, which in itself is also undermining confidence that we have the truth. In economics, of course, it's even stronger than that. Economics is a, 
Perhaps here stands for all sorts of academic disciplines or areas of human inquiry which haven't really achieved the status of science. Uh, you know, something becomes a true science when there is broad agreement on the methodologies by which we establish truth and that the community of scientists will tend to, you know, will converge on the same view on the basis of evidence. In most areas of human inquiry, we haven't reached that status. Economics is one. Economics is something where I, you know, I believe, I'm sure there's been progress in economics and people have understood, uh, understand economics more than they did 100 years ago. But of course, again, the, the more that economics has helped us to understand the world, it's also introduced, it's made clear to us the limitations of that knowledge. And that was obviously most evident at the time of the last financial crash about 10 years ago when things happened which economists did not predict, they didn't warn us about, they couldn't properly understand, and, you know, and, and the whole discipline of economics had a kind of identity crisis. So again, you know, we, we don't trust economists uh, to tell us the truth anymore, but in a sense that's partly a, a victim of their own success because they actually got quite good at doing what they did. When we realise that they actually there's such a lot they didn't still know, it undermined confidence in them. So we have like an increase in understanding, but not as much as we thought. And that again generates a kind of lack of faith that there can be truth in economics. Another factor which is different, quite different to the first two is how in globalisation we have multiplicity. Now what I mean here is this, is that you know, not, not so long ago, really, um, we, we most of us inherited a kind of a world view which was specific to our own culture. And that included a lot of folk wisdom, also in, 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 included a lot of things about how we ought to live, what a good life is, and so forth. And actually, you know, most people could go through their lives without ever having to really question that very much. There might be some social changes over time, but they tended to be gradual and not radical. And that meant we could have a certain kind of trust, if you like, in tradition and convention, as well as authorities, to sort of tell us, you know, how we ought to live and what the right view of the world is. Now, for some time, of course, human beings have been travelling and exploring and have been encountering other cultures. And from the moment they did that, the first thing human beings noticed was how their own ways appeared equally strange to other people. In fact, Rene Descartes um, did this in his Discourse on Method. I think there's a preface to the Discourse on Method in which he talks about what it was like to, to travel. And he didn't travel that far compared to uh, modern people. And how kind of shocked he was and surprised he was to discover that people in these strange countries weren't actually barbarians. Uh, they're actually just as intelligent as us, but they just did things in different ways and just dressed in, 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 in different uh, clothes. Now, as the rate of globalisation has increased, the, the early kind of explorers, although they would notice these things, uh, in the early days, I think it's fair to say that in Western civilization in particular, we, we had a superior view to most cultures we came into contact with. So not at all to our credit. Um, we tended to take a rather imperialistic attitude and, and dismiss other ways as being kind of backward. But and, you know, as uh, this has become more normal and as interaction with different cultures has become more understood, increasingly we've come to appreciate the fact that the way we see things and the way we do things, whoever we may happen to be, is not the only way. There are alternative models, there are alternative ways of understanding. And some of these might be even better, if not at least as good. Not all of them, but some of them might be. So we've opened up this kind of multiplicity of perspectives on the world. Now, what that leads to, in a sense, this, this is, I believe, a positive move. The more we can see things from a, a variety of perspectives and to understand how you know, the traditional way of seeing things from a, a, a you know, Western point of view is not the only one, that should be a huge benefit. It should enable us to enrich our understandings and in order to see, see things a bit more comprehensively. But actually, in practice, a lot of what that's done is really just simply to undermine any kind of confidence 
there is any kind of like truth or right or wrong to be had at all, that everything is culturally relative, that you know, what's true for us has no special status and what's true for other people has no special status. It's simply a case of, you know, it's true for you, it's true for them, it's true for us. There's no truth full stop. Now, I think this is, this is a, a, a terrible mistake, which is possible to explain in a little bit more detail, more detail than I, I have time for. But I, I think the, the, key, the key thing is that, the, the, say, the positive we should take is it's, it's a very different thing to accept that to have the most comprehensive view of the world and understanding of the world, you need to take a variety of different perspectives and see things from, a, from all angles. Like, you know, but that's one thing. It's another thing to say that, therefore, there is no truth to be discovered. There's a very old uh, parable which actually started out in the Buddhist tradition, but it became most popularised by uh, the Jains, of a parable of, of some blind, blind men and an elephant. And they all, they all feel a different part of the elephant. And you know, the person who feels the trunk uh, says, you know, this is a, 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 a bendy, elastic, sort of leathery thing. And so the person who feels the tusk says, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard and rigid thing. The person that feels the tail says it's kind of furry and soft. And of course, the, the parable is, the meaning of the parable should be quite straightforward. That in, in order to understand what the elephant is, you need to combine all the different information gathered by all the different people and not just rely on one. And that's a very kind of beautiful, very positive image of what kind of intercultural dialogue should be like. That to truly understand the world, we need to take into account more perspectives than the one which we historically had. But of course, the parable has its force because we can see there is actually an elephant there to be discovered. There is a truth to be discovered. It's not that the truth of the person who feels the trunk is equally valid as the truth of the person who feels the tail and that there's nothing to choose between them. It's that all of them only have one part of it and you need the whole system. But I think that's that, that kind of more sophisticated understanding hasn't been the one that's dominant. Instead, what's happened is people have simply lost confidence you know, that, that anything from our you know, own culture can have any special status of truth and that everything ends up being a matter of opinion and cultural relativism. A fourth way in which progress has undermined confidence that there is a truth to be discovered is through uh, the media. Now, a free press, a free media, is one of the most important uh, features of any civilised society. It's certainly very important to a functioning democracy. And one of the great achievements of a free press is that it enables us to see truths that were previously hidden. It allows us to look behind the doors of power, uh, to look at sort of the vested interests of some businesses and pharmaceutical companies and so forth. And so if you look at the big picture, a free press has contributed enormously to the uncovering of more truth in the world. And yet again, as this seems to be a pattern that's coming up again and again, this process of revealing truth has in other ways undermined confidence that we can know what the truth is. Because all the media exposure, all the media investigation, every time something is uncovered, it reinforces that sense we have that truth is being hidden from us, that we can't trust governments, we can't trust corporations, we can hardly trust anybody. That's partly because, of course, what we see in the media are precisely the examples of failure. It's where we're being lied to and trust being broken down. We don't, there's no newspaper headline in government statistic turns out to be true, right? That's not really a news headline, but uh, yeah, government statistic manipulated, that's news. So by focusing so much attention on all that's being distorted and hidden and twisted, it undermines confidence there really is any reliable source of truth at all. And that actually also applies eventually to the media itself, because the media itself, as well as being very good at uncovering truth, has sometimes itself been a promoter of falsehoods. So we don't even trust the people who are exposing that other people are not to be trusted. And so this kind of, you know, cycle of distrust gets deepened and deepened. 
And then uh, fifth factor, authority, the questioning of authority. Again, I think it's an undeniable, I think undeniable, point of progress that we question authority in ways in which previous generations did not. Particularly if you think about the ecclesiastical authority that used to exist, the authority that used to reside in, in, you know, in, in, in churches and, and bishops, you know, that gave them extraordinary power. And I think, you know, amongst most Christians today, this isn't an atheist versus religious believer point, most Christians today strongly disapprove of the way in which church authorities had such strong secular power. They think that's actually bad for religious faith. But it's not just religious authorities, all authorities are now more questioned. It, that reveals itself in simply the way we talk to people and the way people are interviewed. If you look at old BBC interviews of prime ministers, even like the 1950s or 1960s, it was extremely deferential, you know. The questions would be like, um, the Prime Minister, would you please tell us, you know, what it is your government is doing to make the country a better place? And the Prime Minister would say, well, certainly, we're doing this, this, this. And yet there was very little questioning. Now it's, um, it's almost the opposite, actually. Uh, a very famous journalist from the time said that his principal, when interviewing uh, any politician, was to ask, why is this lying bastard lying to me? <laughs> and that seems to be the principle now, which most uh, journalists do adopt. But, you know, the, the, the questioning of authority has got to be a positive overall. But, of course, the problem with that is that it then leaves us with, with no authorities anymore. It leaves us with no one to trust to say, can you tell us what the truth is, please? And that, again, um, leads people to, uh, as the English idiom says, throw out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, th the ideal thing is, of course, that what should happen is that authorities are not given the same, an unquestioning acceptance, that we, we do question them. But of course, we do still need experts. This is the distinction. Experts are people who know more about things than ordinary people do. And it should be uncontroversial that there are such things, right? Um, if I want to uh, get, if I have an electrical problem, I want to see an electrician. I don't want a hairdresser. And similarly, if I need a haircut, I want a hairdresser. I don't want an electrician. Uh, and, and there are all sorts of areas. A doc obviously, you go to a doctor uh, when you want to uh, have a medical, when you have a medical problem. You don't go to your hairdresser, which you used to do, actually, of course, in, in, in not so long ago, uh, <laughs> medics and hairdressers were the same profession. Um, so, of course, there has to be expertise. But what's happened is, I think, that the breakdown of trust in authorities has had the effect of undermining even the respect that's had for experts. And so no one's trusted anymore. And so there's a general crisis of not, not really knowing who to trust at all. There's a very famous remark which in the UK has been repeated too much but you, you may not have heard it too much here. During the referendum campaign about whether Britain was going to leave the EU or not, a very senior minister um, said that the British people have had enough of experts and uh, he, was, he wasn't entirely misquoted, he did qualify that in some way but it became this phrase sort of struck a nerve, it became a kind of a symbol of the time that we were in, that people were no longer interested in listening to experts. And I think that's a consequence of uh, the, the negative side effect of the very positive uh, lack, uh, decrease in respect for authority. And finally, uh, more specifically, psych psychology. Our growth understanding in the human mind has, has, again, this is a growth of knowledge. We understand the workings of the human mind better than we have ever done before in the whole of human history. And in that sense, we have discovered truths about the way in which our minds work. The problem is a lot of those truths undermine our confidence in our own rationality and ability to think. So we know, for example, that a lot of our decisions are made automatically on the basis of emotional processes. They're not about rational cognition. We also know that when we try and think rationally, we were often hindered by uh, biases and you know, all sorts of cognitive distortions, things like confirmation bias. So we think we're just examining the evidence, but what happens is 
the evidence that supports our view grabs our attention much more than evidence which doesn't. So actually, you know, un underlying all of this, and, and, and it, although this is research in psychology, it has, I, I think, very much entered the popular mainstream. I don't know how many people here have read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. If you haven't, you've almost certainly read at least one article based on that, and probably much more, and you've probably had conversations with people who have sort of said, well, of course, of, you know, this is the of, the of course thing. You know, the, the rational mind isn't in control. We're just slaves of our irrational impulses. It's just one more piece of the jigsaw. So you can see all these things together. There's, there's a lot going on. It stretches a long way back, but if for many, many different directions, the, the growth of human understanding has had the paradoxical effect of undermining our confidence that we can really know the truth. And I think that is the, the, the cultural background to the more recent specific phenomenon of post-truth in politics. You know, if it, I think if it weren't for the fact that our confidence in able to sort of have trust, that we can know the trustworthy sources of truth, if, we, if that hadn't been undermined by all these different things, then I think perhaps the, the promise of truth in the political domain would not have had the same force. Nonetheless, despite the fact we don't have this confidence, I think there's a lot of evidence that truth is still very much valued. I'll give a few examples. One is from the UK. I don't know if you've come across this word before, blyer. It's uh, obviously a made-up word, and it's, it's made by changing the position of two letters in the name of Tony Blair. To Tony Blair was, not so long ago, one of the most popular prime ministers that Britain ever had. And he ended up becoming one of the least popular prime ministers that Britain has ever had. And the reason for that was the Iraq war. He was very much a supporter of um, uh, the American uh, campaign in uh, Iraq. And to support, to, to, to make the case for the UK joining that coalition, um, he pointed to evidence that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And after the war was finished, no such weapons were found. They were wrong. Now, was he incorrect? Did he make a misjudgment? Or was he a liar? A lot of people say he's a liar, hence this term liar, which at protests you see on, on, on placards. But it, for our purposes here, it doesn't matter whether he was mistaken or lying. The point was, here was a case where people very clearly believed this was not true. They, they thought the fact it was not true very much mattered. And there was no you know, philosophical confusion about true for you or true for me or how do we know what's true and you can't really be confident what's true really, can you, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there are lots of concrete examples where when it boils down to it, people still very much see a difference between true and false. They see it as very fairly clear and they think that it matters. That's just one example, but I mean, everyday example. If you go to, a, if you are a witness in a court case in the UK, you have to promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I can tell you that anyone who takes that oath, even if they are, if you, even if they make their living as a postmodern academic, whose you know, writings are questioning what is truth really, et cetera, et cetera, in a courtroom, no one has any problem understanding what that statement means, and no one has any problem following it. If they don't follow it, it's because they don't intend to tell the truth. It's as simple as that. It's not because they are under some kind of philosophical confusion. Perhaps the third example is um, about, which is slightly more ambiguous, is a very famous uh, remark that Bill Clinton said to the American people, at the time of the Monica Lewinsky scandal, he looked the American people in the eye, in other words, he looked into the television camera, and he said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. Now, the interesting thing about that is you might say that was a barefaced lie. There are a lot of people who say that it wasn't. What enabled Bill Clinton to say that with such sincerity is that in Arkansas, where he comes from, sexual relations has a very specific meaning and the act which was performed 
by Monica Lewinsky upon him did not count as sexual relations on that definition, right? Now, the point there is that, again, people, that didn't matter. People knew that his, his intention by saying that was that people would understand that nothing happened between him and Monica Lewinsky, and clearly something did happen. He was, even if he was not technically telling a lie, he was trying to deceive. He was trying to make people believe something that was not true. People were cross about that, people were angry about that, and it was very clear. So despite all the facts that on the one hand there's lots of a lack of confidence about what we trust as sources of the truth, and I think there's a lot of that, it isn't the case that people don't believe that there's a distinction between true and false, that they understand what that distinction means, and it matters a great deal for them. So the problem is that there are no trusted sources of truth. And that is a very real problem. Because if, there's, if, there, if there aren't any sources of truth that you really trust, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a few things. The first is that gut trumps the mind. What I mean there is, and it's unfortunate you word the use of the word trump here. <laughs> uh, trumps is, you know, it's like in cards, you know, it beats. Trumps, it, it, my heart, gut beats mind. In other words, if, if you lack confidence that there is any kind of rational way to distinguish between a reliable source of truth and an unreliable source of truth, then either you've got two choices. You can simply be completely agnostic about everything and say, I don't know. In practice, that's extremely difficult. You know, you have to make choices. You have to make your bets. So if you don't just give up completely, but you can't trust your mind, the only thing you've got left to trust is your gut. It's as simple as that, right? So, and I think this is, again, explains a lot of what um, was going on in say something like the, the referendum in the UK. Um, I think a lot of people believed that they, they didn't really know how to answer the question, would Britain be better off inside or outside of the EU by rational means? They, they, it, because all the things that you required to make that rational decision were untrustworthy. You're going to go on what economists say? Well, we don't trust economists. You know, they, they, got the, they didn't even predict the crash. What do they know? Uh, and even if we do, which statistics are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the statistics which come out of the government office? No, we don't, we don't trust them. What about the rational arguments themselves? I mean, do we trust the politicians to give the rational arguments? No, people don't trust them. Um, so there's this lack of trust in, in all these things. And so you're left just with a gut feeling. And I think that what swayed it for a lot of people was that in Britain, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people who have a strong emotional attachment to Europe. I mean, I, I do. Partly, I'm half Italian, you know. So for me, it was, it, 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 there isn't, I, haven't, I feel European. That is very unusual, I think, for a, a British person, okay? So they didn't have the emotional attraction to it, but they did have an emotional appeal to patriotism and independence and Britain doing its own way. So you can give the arguments all day long, but given that people don't really trust the facts and the statistics and the rationality behind the arguments, what they trust instead is the gut. In a similar kind of way, values trump facts. So what I mean here is that, again, if people don't trust the facts are reliable, then in the end what they're going to do is they're going to vote not according to the evidence, but according to... Uh, which values a camp stands for. And again, I think that in, in the British case, uh, people were fa found it much more attractive, the value of autonomy and doing your own thing, rather than what they sought the value of um, giving away your sovereignty to Brussels. I hate to, I, don't, I don't know if you, you probably all know this, but in, in Britain, for so many people, Brussels is kind of like a dirty word, right? It, it, sta it stands for the remote, faceless, um, you know, European Union which has no interest in Britain. It, that's not what it means to me, but, you know, just, just so that you know when you go to Britain, be careful about, about Brussels. Say, say you come from Belgium, say you live in Belgium, they'll be perfectly happy with that. Most people don't even know Brussels is in Belgium, to be honest. <laughs> 
So uh, values trump facts. And, but perhaps most importantly, or, uh, authenticity trumps competence. I think this is an extraordinary feature of the post-truth world, is that time and again, political parties and leaders have gained support, even though a lot of us just think these people are, you know, buffoons, clowns, idiots, whatever it might be. Not always, of course, but in many cases. And why is that? Well, again, I think if you take something like, let's look at the uh, last American presidential election. You had, not by a large margin, and actually not by a popular vote, let's remember that, but, you know, nevertheless, an extraordinary amount of support for a man who was, um, you know, um, what could we say, ignorant, misogynistic, prejudiced, arrogant, all these things. He defeated a candidate who had one of the, you know, the most distinguished records of political service and political competence in history, right? How could he have done that? How could he have done that? Uh, given the fact that I know there are elements around the electoral system which helped to make it possible, but how did they do that? Well, I think, again, you have to go back to the element of trust. The fact of the matter is that the, so much of the population simply did not trust either side to be telling the truth or to be standing up for the, you know, to, to, be, to, to, to believe what they were saying. And so in that sense, I think that a lot of people, they went for Trump because he seemed to be more authentic than Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was the professional politician from the professional classes, right? And that is bad, right? Donald Trump, he may be a buffoon and a misogynist and everything, but he, he is what he appears to be, right? So it, that's, what, that's one of the bizarre things about a lot of these populist leaders. They make mistakes and they're not punished for them. It's a double standard because if you're someone like Donald Trump and you make a mistake, that just proves, well, of course, he's a real person. He's not a career politician. He's not, of course he makes mistakes. He's a real person. Whereas Hillary Clinton is judged on a different standard. She's meant to be a professional politician and she can't even get everything right, <laughs> okay? So it's this idea that authenticity becomes the key value because, again, you don't, they don't trust either side to be telling the truth, but they do judge one side to be more authentic than the other. Another element of this, which is a bit more disturbing, is that conspiracy trumps cock up. So when you don't trust what's going on in the system, when you don't trust people to be telling you the truth, if things turn out badly, there's a strong tendency for people to believe it wasn't a mistake, it's rather the corrupt elite doing things deliberately to manipulate. There has been, I think, quite a large growth in conspiracy theories, and I think that's partly explained by a diminishing of trust in, in, in truth. And finally, I think, you know, that the partisan tribe trumps impartial expertise. And this is perhaps one of the most worrying things from a point of view of, you know, civic society. Democracy. One of the great things about democracy is that it enables people with different interests and different values to live together side by side, right? Now, the problem is that that is very much un undermined when if people end up clustering together even more so in their tribes. And I think that the point there is that that happens more. When you don't trust any impartial experts to present the truth in an impartial way, when you're looking for things to believe or to support, you simply gather around the people on your team in your tribe. So the polarisation of society is also affected by this. So that's a diagnosis of a lot of the problems. So how do we put truth back into this process? Well, this is where we might get a little bit, it might seem idealistic, but I, I hopefully isn't idealistic. When I wrote the book, when I finished the first draft, and I was trying to see what really was connecting everything together, I was slightly surprised in a way. What I kind of noticed was that I wasn't really saying, offering a different theory or concept of truth. That didn't seem to be the heart of the problem. What was more important than that was what I'd call attitudes. And I think this is, this is, this is, this is quite an interesting point, 
I think. You know, truth in philosophical circles is discussed as though there are competing theories, competing definitions of truth. But actually, I think in practical, in practical life, in the real world, what matters is not really what theory of truth you have, it's whether you have the appropriate attitude towards t truth. And I think that if we, if we do care about truth, what we want to try and promote as much as possible are these attitudes, right? Now, what are they? Now, the, the, the British philosopher Bernard Williams, his last book was called Truth and Truthfulness, and he identified a couple of these attitudes. The first one he had, he called sincerity. And it's quite simple, really. What it means is that you have to, have, you have to sincerely want to know the truth in order to get there, right? Simple as that. Uh, you've got to want to find the truth, not to be motivated to um, basically find the beliefs or the opinions or the facts that fit your worldview. So you start with commitment to sincerity. You sincerely look for the truth. You combine that with accuracy. Accuracy meaning that you, wherever facts are involved, you kind of aim to get those facts right. And Williams's argument is really, I mean, I'm, this is not his words, but the way I see it, it's like if you set out with sincerity, with sincerity and accuracy as your guiding values, then truth kind of takes care of itself. Yeah? Uh, someone who is sincerely looking for the truth, who is concerned to get be accurate with the facts, is very, very likely to end up at the truth. And I think that's really important because that's kind of what we need to encourage in terms of political discourse in particular. You know, I think that you know, accuracy is something which is easier to work on in a way, but sincerity isn't there. It's for so long, I think, Politics has become so much about the art of persuasion. It's become so much involved in marketing and targeting swing voters, etc., etc. But actually, the sincerity of politics has gone out of the window. And that's why some of the most popular politicians now are the ones who appear to be sincere, right? No matter, people will say, no matter what you say about them, I don't like this about them, I don't like that about them, but they are sincere. Now, at the moment, the problem is that the politicians who are making capital out of appearing to be sincere are generally offering simplistic solutions and appealing to atavistic sort of populist sentiments. But I think that what the rest of politics has to learn from this is that, you know, sincerity is, the, is, is really part of the key. Um, another virtue, though, is, is modesty. I was talk when I was talking earlier about all the ways in which our confidence in the truth has been undermined, the only way to deal with that is to just be more realistic about the fact that, you know, do you know what, there is not much that we can know to be true with absolute certainty. You know, we have to become much more accustomed to accepting the fact that things are uncertain and we can't know for sure. And that's not, that's not a reason to give up on truth, it's just a reason to, as it were, hold the truth a little bit more, more lightly. And this is a much more broader cultural point. It's a kind of, you know, to put it in grand terms, it's part of the maturity of humanity that it has to go through this stage of where we kind of wanted all the important truths in life to be clear and certain, and we wouldn't have to think about them too much. And coming to live with uncertainty is an important point of becoming more um, mature as humans. And that entails a kind of, a modesty about what we know. So if we go back to take the example of economics, the, the le lessons economists should learn from their humiliation at the financial crisis is not that they should give up and do something else, it's just that they need to be more open about the modesty of what they can do, be more open about the fact that they, 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 they don't know for sure and that they're at best offering tools for understanding. We need to promote skepticism rather than cynicism. It's very important that we're skeptical and questioning, but if that turns into a kind of cynicism where we don't believe anybody anymore, it becomes dangerous and pernicious. Uh, openness is also an important virtue for, for establishing the truth. Trust, particularly in governments and any kind of authority, to, for that to be earned back, it's very, very important that there is a certain transparency and openness there that people can see nothing is being hidden because a lot of this mistrust comes from a perception that too much historically has been hidden. 
Um, another aspect is we have to be more uh, aware of the fact that the project of discovering any kind of truth is a, is a collective kind of enterprise, that no one has a monopoly on it. And so, you know, you never defer to just one expert. You try and bring expertise together to get a whole picture. I think this is, this is a large point to throw out quite briefly at, at this point, but in, in the sort of in the Western imagination, certainly since sort of Descartes, perhaps going back before, has seen reason as very much a solitary enterprise. We always think of the philosopher as the solitary person, thinking alone in, in, in the study and so forth. I think we've got to become much smarter about recognising the fact that it's actually a collective enterprise and arriving at the truth is, 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 it requires that. Um, truth is something that we have to also be aware that we have to... There's this phrase of speaking truth to power, which I think is an important thing. And, and I think that um, truth, truth is not the same thing as power, right? It's very important to recognise that there are truths which are not the same things as people try to exercise their power by uh, you know, pushing something as the truth. But we, we need to understand truth as something that we can actually use to challenge power. And that's a way of bringing back faith in it. And I think we should remind ourselves of this, actually. When people become cynical of truth and sort of believe it doesn't exist, we ought to remind ourselves that, you know, virtually every time a powerful body has, which has been abusing its position, has been brought back to earth, it's been because in some way the truth has been uh, brought, to, they've been held to account against the truth. Um, and the final point I would say there is that uh, we have to recognise that actually uh, we can create truths. This, this, this might sound a strange thing to say. If we say we create truths, it's like, does that mean we can make things up? Well, no. Being creative with the truth means, is a euphemism. It's a way of saying we're basically going to sort of pretend things are different to how they are in order to achieve what we want to achieve. But actually, you know, true, a lot of the most important truths of the world are not simply facts that already exist to be changed or not changed. If, uh, take equality, for example. There, there are facts about the status of equality, economic, gender, whatever, racial, at the moment. These are facts which exist. But the future facts about these things, are, are, what they will be depend upon what we do and how we create them. Because time is short, I'm actually going to run through and ignore this whole next slide. So sorry about that, I'm not going to talk about rhetoric. Um, and I'm just going to say, finally, before I finish, about the long game. I, I, like I said before, if you want to talk about rhetoric, ask me afterwards. Um, if we understand that the underlying causes for the lack of belief that we can have reliable sources of truth, if we believe, if you accept the argument that it's a long history, I think we have to see that changing the situation is also going to take time. There's no magic cure for the lack of trust in our capacity to know the truth. We have to play the long game. Trust needs to be rebuilt slowly. So if, you know, if politics, if in the political sphere we're going to overcome this post-truth moment, then mainstream political parties have a, a lot of work to do to rebuild trust. And trust is like that. Trust is very easily lost, and when it's lost, it takes time to rebuild. I think people have to appreciate this is a long-term project and it can't be done quickly. It also means complexity needs to be embraced. Our, you know, the, lack of, the lack of anything to hold on to as, as a clear and simple source of truth is leading people to run away from the real complexity of the world. And I think there has to be more honesty about complexity, particularly in politics. I think the problem at the moment is that people see populist politicians offering simple solutions and how do you compete with that? You can compete either by trying to offer your own simple solutions, but that's a mistake because there are no simple solutions. We need to be more open about explaining the complexity of things. And th that essentially means that democracy needs in itself to be reformed. Democracy in the popular imagination has come to be seen incorrectly as the expression of the will of the people, right? Now, I say incorrectly, that's not what it is. There is no such thing as the will of the people. The people are complex, the people have diverse interests, they have different wills. Democracy is actually about the management 
of these different wills into a way of running a country which allows different people to live together with different interests. So actually, you know, um, the, the renewal of democracy, it actually requires that we become much clearer about that. I've talked for rather too long because I do want to have time for questions, but um, I thank you for your time and we will now have a, a little bit of time for some questions from you. Thank you.